Good morning and welcome to our worship service for Sunday, July 19. We also welcome those who watch this video presentation of the service. We are Dean Bernard. Actor Bernard. Camara Bernard. Ami. Remy Bernard and Kaylee Bernard. God has called us to worship him and because of what Jesus has done, we have the freedom to worship him. Please join us in reciting today's call to worship, adapted from Lamentations 3. Your steadfast love, Lord, never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, so let us proclaim. Let your faith little bread of your love. Great is your mercy and greatly is your name to be praised. That was a perfect intro, I, and I invite you to worship with us too, whether you're here in this setting or you're watching it online later. Um, wherever you are, come and worship with us. And I want to ask you, are you hungry for God this morning? If there's one thing I've learned and continue to relearn, it's that I need Jesus more than I really know. Um, does anybody need love? Does anybody need strength? Does anybody need hope or rescue or wisdom? Whatever it is that we need um, for life and godliness, he has richly provided in Christ Jesus. He is mighty and he never fails us. Psalm 28, 6 and 7 says, Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I'm helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jaden Berg. I'm the associate pastor here at Dominique Bible Church. I'd just like to welcome those of you who are with us now and welcome to those who are joining us online later. Um, I get songs stuck in my head all the time. Uh, and lately, more often than not, those songs are um, kids' songs because that's what we play for Henry. So it's like wheels on the bus. Wheels on the bus go. Yeah, all the time, every day. That's what's in my head. But over the last couple days, it's actually uh, been a worship song called King of My Heart. Uh, And if you don't know it, uh, the chorus uh, is very simply, you are good, good. Uh, Oh, there's an O in there. But the the premise is is just the whole chorus is you are good, you are good, you are good over and over again. Uh, And and I found myself, uh, after hearing that song in my head over and over again, uh, reminded of the goodness of God. Uh, Psalm 119, uh, verses 68, is in the middle of a portion of Psalm 119 where the psalmist is, is recognizing the value of the afflictions that he's faced. Uh, and he gives this really uh, incredibly simple verse, uh, uh, as simple as the chorus of the song. It, it, it says, You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Uh, and I just love the straightforwardness of that. You know, God, you are good. Uh, and because... Um, you are good. The, the actions that you do are good. Uh, and since you're good and your actions are good, you're someone who's worth following. And I want you to teach me how to follow you better. Uh, and that's something that I need to remind myself on a, on a pretty regular basis of the goodness of God and that, that because he is so good and because of everything he has done and his plan for me and all of that is all good, then he's someone that I, I should follow with everything that I have. Uh, One announcement we have this morning is we just wanted to thank all of our uh, awesome volunteers who come uh, early Sunday morning and uh, help get everyone in uh, in a safe uh, and orderly way, and we really appreciate all the work that they do. Uh, And we're looking for for more volunteers to help out. Uh, And so if you're willing to be a a sanitizer sprayer or a mask hand router uh, or something like that, uh, just uh, send the office a message, uh, and we'd love to get you plugged in helping out uh, where you can. Uh, also, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, please, again, wear your, your masks while we're singing. Uh, the bathrooms uh, and a child feeding room uh, are at the back. If you just you can head out uh, the back doors, uh, and an usher will direct you in the right way to go. Uh, we ask that you remain seated after the service, um, after the benediction is finished, uh, and our ushers will dismiss by rows. Uh, and then there are offering plates uh, available at the exits because we won't be handing those around. And we just wanted to thank you for that as well. Thank you for your faithful and generous giving uh, as we've moved into this new phase of coming to church. We'll be moving into a time of prayer now, uh, and the responsive prompt that I ask you to say with me is, you are good. Uh, So when I say, God, we pray, you say, you are good. So let's pray. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to meet together, whether it's here in person or online or in our homes. I thank you for your goodness to us, that you give us the air to breathe and a world to enjoy. I thank you that you have a good plan for each of our lives and that your Holy Spirit is working in all of us to draw us closer to you. God, we pray you are good. We thank you for our global partners and for the work that they're doing in service to you. I pray that you continue to bless each one of them in their ministries. Uh, May they have the wisdom and strength and compassion needed to spread the message uh, of your love to the people around them. Uh, May they continue to rely on you for, for health and for whatever they need. God, we pray you are good. We pray for our community of Dominey. I thank you for this town that you've given to us to be a part of. I pray that you would give the leadership of Dominey wisdom as they lead our town. I pray for our businesses, whether they're big or small, that that they may feel your blessing. Help them uh, as they may feel the different effects of being through a pandemic and just guide them through this. God, we pray you are good. We pray for those who are sick, whether they're fighting a physical illness or a mental one. We pray that you would bring them healing. Uh, Help them to feel the comfort that you provide and to know that you have a plan for their lives. Be with the families and friends of those who are sick as they provide support. And I just pray that you give them the words to say uh, and then the things they need to do through those difficult times. God, we pray you are good. And we thank you again for your incredible goodness to us. May we seek to always serve you better 
Uh, Help us to know you more and give us the confidence to share your goodness with those around us. Help us to be a light of you to those in our homes, in our workplaces, and in our neighborhoods. God, we pray you are good. Amen. We're going to sing another song here. So as we do, I ask you to stand and put on your mask to sing. And I'll just uh, read from Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 23. And it says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful.
Thank you, and welcome to all of you who are here this morning and those that will get a chance later to watch this. Um, we haven't worked out all the details yet. We're still trying to figure out how to make this more accessible and better for those who are not able to be here with us on a Sunday morning. We do not want to lose engagement with any of you uh, through this time of change that we're going through. Uh, before I begin, I'm going to echo uh, something that Jaden said when he talked about songs going through his head because he's listening to him. One day he had to look after Henry here while Jen went to an appointment and I kept hearing this song over and over in my head and it was the wheels on the bus go round and round. <laughs> and I was like, got to close my door, got to close my door because I get so easily distracted as it is. So that was uh, interesting. Well, Welcome here today. Glad to have you with us. Uh, this last week, I noticed that on the Dalmany FYI Facebook, somebody posted their frustration, and maybe some of you could echo this, their frustration with nighttime trains blaring their horns as they come through the town crossings. Maybe they haven't lived here very long yet. I don't know. Uh, years ago, when we lived in the town of Foam Lake, we lived right across the street from the grain elevator. And the trains didn't always stop. They went through. And I remember very distinctly the first time I heard the train horn in the middle of a cold, clear, still winter night. I literally thought the train was coming through my bedroom. But over time, I got used to it. Didn't notice it after a while. It's kind of like newborn, or fathers of newborn children. They hear their baby for a while, and then all of a sudden they don't hear their baby anymore. Right, Mom? Or it's kind of like having a chime clock. After a while, you don't even notice the chimes ringing. It all becomes white noise after a while. When we get used to familiar sounds, it's easy to ignore them. The same principle applies to, I would say, how we respond to the promises that God has made to us. We can get so used to the promises of God that we lose our excitement and appreciation for them. They become white noise. Hmm? Our theme this summer is God's wonderful for... Oh, that's, the, that's definitely a song. Could I have something else up there? Picture? That would be good. Um... Our theme this summer is God's picture. It, uh, it's, uh, thank you. God's wonderful forever gifts. And those we're talking about as we began the very first week, they refer to God's promises towards us. They're gifts. It says in James chapter 117, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. All of us love to receive a gift, but the best gifts that we could ever receive come to us from God. And the best gifts are his promises towards us because his promises, unlike the gifts we get, they never break, they never wear out, they are forever to us. Every week, we've been opening this box, this gift box, and we pull out a promise to remind us of God's wonderful gifts, a gift that God gives to us. In week one, we were reminded of this. God always keeps his promises. Would you say that with me? God always keeps his promises. That's important for us to remember and to verbalize. We read the story of Abraham and Isaac and Sarah and God's promise to them of having a son whose name was Isaac. They waited a long time, but God did what he said he would do because God always keeps his promises. The word picture, as you see on the screen and is up here, uh, for this promise is grass. And the reason for that is because our key verse was Isaiah 40, verse 8, which says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever, which means God always keeps his promises to us. 
Well, last week, Pastor Jaden, and I listened to him, it was great. Pastor Jaden shared with you a promise from God that only comes true if we act in faith and believe in Jesus. And that promise is this, salvation for all who call on his name. Repeat that with me, salvation for all who call on his name. He told you the story of Jesus hanging on the cross between two thieves. One of the robbers was saved because he placed his faith in Jesus, but the other was not because he would not and did not put his trust in Jesus Christ. Our key verse for that is Hebrews 11.1, 1, which states, Now faith is the assurance, the assurance, it's like a promise that comes true, of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. When we admit that we are sinners and that Jesus died to rescue us from sin, the Bible says to us that everyone who calls on Jesus will be saved. Well, let's look inside our present and discover another promise another wonderful forever gift from God. This one says, faithful to forgive. Guess what? I'm going to ask you to say that too. Faithful to forgive. That's right. And so we're going to put that up. Not all of you can see that, but you can see the picture up there. It's the same one. We'll put it right up front here this morning. Everyone in this room Every one of us, and everyone who will be listening to this online, we all have been hurt by someone's words or actions towards us. Years ago, this week, maybe even this morning, it could have happened at the playground, it could have happened at school, it happens in our homes, it happens at our work, it even happens at church. And many times we want to say or do something to hurt that person back. But that's not what Jesus is like. When they arrested Jesus, they spit on him, they made fun of him, they beat him, they pushed a sharp crown of thorns into his head. They were mean, they were cruel to Jesus. And when they tied him to the cross and began hammering the nails into his hands and feet, Jesus didn't want to hurt them. He wanted to love them. And this is what he said. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus' heart, we see here, is full of mercy. He wants to be kind to those who don't deserve it. And through that one act, that one act, he revealed God's heart towards us, which is this that God is eager to forgive us. He loves to forgive us. We need to hear that. And to help us understand this, Jesus told a story that we read about in Luke chapter 15. It's the story called the prodigal son. Now, we don't use that word prodigal very often, so what does it really mean? I didn't go to the dictionary for this definition. I think this, this makes sense, though. A prodigal is someone who makes decisions that really hurts, especially other members of their family. It's the pain of having a son or a daughter, a grandson, a granddaughter, a mother or a father, an aunt or an uncle that gets caught up with maybe dangerous or foolish friends, maybe getting hooked on drugs, involved in criminal activity, not taking care of themselves, gambling addictions, maybe promiscuous relationships, or maybe, maybe they live a really good life, but they reject God. The decisions of a prodigal cause a lot of pain. Jesus shared this story after being criticized by the community religious leaders for spending time with the tax collectors who stole money from people and sinners who disobeyed God's word. The religious leaders could not understand why would Jesus spend time with people who hurt others. 
In this story, he talks about a father who has two sons. Many of you here know this story. His eldest son was a responsible man who had an important role in his father's business. He worked hard, and he, was a respe- and he respected his dad. The younger son was what we would call, and maybe it's not the fairest term, because I don't want to put everybody in this category, but he was kind of strong-willed. He didn't like the thought of having to get up every morning to do the chores. He demanded his share of his father's money, and this is what it said. Not many days later, after his father gave him the money that he wanted, this younger son gathered all he had, took a journey into a far country, and it says there he lived like a prodigal. He squandered his property in reckless living. His decisions would not only end up hurting himself, but they were a real slap in the face to his dad. He rejected the one who loved him the most. Jesus said this young man eventually hit rock bottom. He was out of money. He had no more friends. And he ended up working for a pig farmer, which in our day would sound like a slap in the face to a pig farmer, which we shouldn't because pig farmers are needed. We enjoy eating pork and bacon. But it's a real contradiction to the Jewish cleanliness laws of that with, for their people, meaning this boy at this point working for a pig farmer and wanting to eat the pig food, he was really far from God in his life, and he was really far from his people. He was alone. He was a mess. The only view from the bottom, though, is what? Up. And he realized how foolish and hurtful he had been and how he had misjudged his father. So he made a very humbling decision to return home, to ask for forgiveness from his dad, and hopefully he'd be given an opportunity to work as a hired hand on his dad's farm. Form a picture in your mind as you hear how Jesus describes what happens in this text. He arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The way this son had hurt his father, you'd expect a different response, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? What would you expect hearing from the father? You have a lot of nerve showing up here after you're disrespecting me and disrespecting this family. I suppose you blew everything and you've come back for more money. I want nothing to do with you. You are dead to me. Now, you would find those answers harsh, but there are people that would actually say that. But his father had been looking for him, it says, looking for him, looking expectantly for his son to return, longing for his son to come back and change his ways. And when he saw him, it says, tucking his tunic between his legs, this respectable, respectable man did something very unrespectful by tucking his tunic between his legs and showing off his legs. And he ran unashamed towards his son, and it says he embraced him and he kissed him. And in the clutch of his father, the son spoke these words, Father, I was so foolish. I sinned against God. I sinned against you. I don't deserve your forgiveness. I don't deserve to be your son. And before he could finish his confession, it says his father restored him and celebrated with these words. Let's celebrate the return of my son. This is God's heart towards us. He loves to forgive us. You need to hear that. He loves to forgive us. The prophet Isaiah records this declaration that he heard from God. And it says, I, God speaking, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. 
I remember when I was in high school doing math tests. I don't know if you guys really remember those as well. I, I, the, high, the farther I went in high school, the worse I got in math. But I remember doing the tests, and I would write out my formulas, and I'd work towards my solutions on that paper, and checking my answers before handing it in, I'd recognize the mistake. And what would I do? I'd erase it so it was gone. And I'd begin again. That is what God does when he forgives us. He literally erases it. It's not kept in a file folder. It's not kept on a hard drive. It's not embedded in his memory. It's no longer held against us or brought up at a later date. Now, the image that we've chosen to represent this promise today, you think is kind of strange. Why do you have ice cream up there? Some of you have been wondering about that. I want to talk briefly just right now to the children, and you adults can listen in. Kids, I want to talk to you. Sometimes you get to go to grandma's house for supper, right? Yeah, it's great. Something I always looked forward to when I went to grandma's house was dessert. Because I always knew I'd get dessert at grandma's house. If grandma said to you as you sat down to eat, after supper, we're going to have ice cream. Oh, you would be so happy. That's a good promise, Grandma. Especially if you like ice cream. And Grandma has the flavor that you like. But if Grandma instead said this, sounding more like mom and dad, if you eat all your supper, you can have ice cream for dessert. What is different about that promise? It's a promise, but what's different about it? Do you know for sure that you're going to get ice cream? Will you get ice cream if you don't finish your supper? Mm. This is called a promise with a condition. There's something that must happen first or you must do to get the promised ice cream. If you do not eat all your supper, Grandma does not have to give you the ice cream. Why not? Because you did not keep the conditions of her promise. Now, some of God's promises that he gives us are promises that come with conditions. People think that God should give us what we want all the time. He made all these promises. I don't get his promises. Some people don't understand that many of God's promises are the result of our obedience. If God is so loving... Shouldn't he forgive everyone without having to ask him? Forgiveness is one of the promises of God that has a condition attached to it. And the condition is this. You need to ask God to forgive you. Our key verse is 1 John 1 verse 9. It says there, and someone, I liked how they described it. They called it an iffy promise. Because it starts with the word if. The word if means there is something we must do for that promise to come true. And what is it? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word confess means you own it. You don't make excuses for it. You may not comprehend the damage that it's caused when you did it, but you understand that your words or your actions have hurt others or they've hurt God. As we reflect on God's wonderful forever gift of forgiveness, I just want to first say this is at the heart of God's promise of salvation. A relationship with God begins with recognizing I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. And we need to believe that Jesus is the only one who can forgive us because he died for us. That's why he came to this earth, to die for our sins. It says in Scripture, in him, here's a promise, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, you may be a follower of Jesus, has this promise become white noise to you? 
you don't think about it very often anymore? When's the last time you've talked to God and asked for forgiveness? When's the last time you've talked to somebody else and asked for forgiveness? Is it a concept that you've recently experienced? Having come to faith in Jesus, have you become blind to the hurt you cause your heavenly Father or others in your life? When was the last time you confessed to him and to others hurting words, hurting actions, and received the promise of his forgiveness? Or do you just make excuses or try to explain your justification for what you did? We are called to ask for his forgiveness and to receive it. Receiving his forgiveness, though, thirdly, we also must forgive others. But because we're not yet like Jesus, we struggle with granting forgiveness and erasing from our minds what is confessed. The Bible says, forgive each other, just as in Christ God has forgiven you. I would like to ask you now to join me in a prayer that most of you would know. You've learned it from childhood. We may have learned to say it differently, but listen to it closely as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go Go now, now, as as the Spirit Spirit of God has called you, to be a people of grace, to be a people of truth, to be a people who pursue peace, to be people who forgive, to be a people who love, and And may God God lead and guide you. Amen. Amen.